Hello, friends, explorers on the infinite landscapes of wisdom. In this video, I want to talk about how you could possibly exist anywhere on any landscape. Specifically, I want to talk about how you could relate to atoms. If the world is fundamentally composed of mindless bits of reality, call these atoms, how do you fit into the world? If you have a mind and if you can think and feel, how do you relate to fundamentally mindless units of reality? So to help us to think about this topic, I want to start by just sharing with you my big purpose. My purpose is to assess every possible theory of your relationship to atoms. And I'm going to stipulate just for sake of argument that these atoms are themselves mindless. We can think about another view on which fundamental units of reality are not mindless, but I want to think about every possible theory of your relationship to mindless atoms. So the three major outcomes in this presentation are first, I'm going to unpack various puzzles of parts, how you could relate to parts. And thinking about these puzzles will help us to think about different types of solutions people have given to these puzzles, as well as these problems. And these problems will come to life as we apply the light of reason and we look carefully at some things that very few people have examined. And I can just say that for me, when I began to study this topic of conscious beings and how conscious beings are related to atoms and parts and various things, I was completely unaware of these types of problems. It wasn't until I got into graduate school, started studying different philosophers of mind, coming at this topic from various perspectives, pointing to these, these problems. And these are the kind of problems that I can just say that in my own journey, they didn't go away easily on inspection. In fact, some of these problems have loomed larger on inspection. Inspection didn't make them go away. Instead, they invited me to think more carefully about how I could possibly exist anywhere in reality. And I think you're going to appreciate some of the challenges that I'm going to share with you. And then in the end, I want to show my own solution, which I think is going to highlight a certain power of what I'm going to call a mind first approach. This is a, an approach on which you aren't actually fundamentally built up and made out of mindless things, but instead you are a fundamental being that has a mind and you are related to mindless things, not again in terms of the mindless coming first, but in terms of you coming first. I'm going to talk about this at the end. I'm going to talk about how this view, right or wrong, can help us to solve some of these particular puzzles. So. Let's have a look at the different theories. I'm going to start with a theory that you don't exist. So this is theory one. This is a way of answering the question, how are you related to mindless atoms? Let's just assume that the basic building blocks of reality are mindless bits of reality. And we'll call these atoms for sake of argument. We could think of these as physical atoms that are uh, themselves composed of subatomic particles. But for sake of neutrality, I wanted to sort of leave open the nature of the atoms and just assume one thing, which is that they are mindless. So how are you related to mindless atoms? One answer is that you're not because you don't actually exist. According to this view, the basic units of reality are kind of like the bits of this cloud here. They don't have minds. They don't have thoughts. They don't have hopes and dreams. Instead, these things just organize to form complex structures, maybe brains that function as if they think, as if they have a sense of self, but there's not actually a real sense of self. Or if there is, that sense of self is itself an illusion. There's not actually a real self. There's not actually you. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not making any assumptions here about what you would be if you did exist. Later, we're going to look at theories of how you might be identical with certain configurations of atoms. But on this first theory, I want to consider the idea that you don't exist at all. All there are are mindless bits of reality, mindless atoms, and you are not included within reality. So here's a kind of a, a challenge for each of these theories. I'm going to raise a challenge. My goal is not to say that this is a knockdown challenge, but just, just that this is a kind of question or a challenge that somebody who would hold that theory would have to deal with. 
So the self-defeat challenge, I call this, this will be kind of familiar. You're familiar with this idea. It's a common question. How could you, if you exist, doubt that you exist? Or if you don't exist, then how could you doubt that you exist? It seems like either way, you've got to be in existence to even doubt that you exist. This is Descartes famous question, right? Like to even doubt that I exist, my doubt has to exist. Now there are different ways you can respond to this. You could say, well, it's actually not you that's doubting. It's something else that's having a doubt. Um, but this is a, a bit of a challenge to understand in what sense then this something else isn't you. I mean, after all, if you're not doubting, then you're not even there to disagree with this view at all. It's just something else. So again, I don't say this is a knockdown challenge. But this is something to consider. And this first theory, you might think this is not a theory that people would normally hold. And I think that's right. I mean, most people think that they exist. If you ask them, do you exist? You know, that's kind of a strange question. Why are you even asking the question? But it's interesting when we look at the puzzles later, the puzzles later of seeing how you could possibly exist could inspire some doubts about your existence. There's a philosopher, Peter Younger, Peter Unger, Earlier in his career, he raised some doubts about whether he himself exists. Later in his career, he found a way around those doubts, a, a kind of a solution. But then that solution involved rethinking the kind of being that he is. What kind of a being are you? Well, that's at stake here. So let's consider then another theory. Let's say that instead you do exist. And again, I'm looking at every possible, every conceivable theory of how you could be related to atoms. So the first one, you don't exist. The second one is you do, and what you are is a particular atom. You are a single atom. When I think about this theory, what I want to do is distinguish between two versions of the theory. One version is that you are a being who has thoughts and feelings. You can reflect on who you are. You can reflect on the question. And so if you are an atom, then you are an atom that thinks. A different idea is that uh, we're going to stipulate that the atoms are mindless and so that if you are an atom, then you are mindless. You are not the kind of thing that has a mind. And so you can have thoughts in your mind. Now, like I said, for sake of argument, I'm going to assume here that atoms are mindless. It's not because we can't think of another theory on which atoms have a mind. That will come later. We'll think about how you could be a simple thing that has a mind. That, that's something one could consider. In that sense, you might be an atom of some sort. But here, I want to just think about an atom as mindless. And on the mindless atom view, this theory would be leading us back to that self-defeat challenge. It's kind of the same question. How can a mindless atom think it is a mindless atom? If it's mindless, it doesn't have a mind. So it can't form thoughts in its mind to wonder, hey, am I an atom? What am I? To even understand the question, you have to have a power to be aware of yourself from a first person experience. In other words, if you have a thought, I might be an atom or I might not be an atom. That thought occurs within your mind. And by mind here, I don't mean anything sort of fancy or technical. I'm, I'm just using this in a kind of ordinary English language to refer to an experience of having something within consciousness. So I kind of like this definition of a mind is just that which includes contents of consciousness. So this will include thoughts, if thoughts can be contents of consciousness. And here I'm thinking of a content of consciousness as something that you can be aware of from a first person point of view. So if you can be aware of your thoughts from a first person point of view, then on this definition, you have a mind. And so you're not a mindless atom. So there would be this challenge for understanding how you could possibly think that you're a mindless atom or even entertain the question if you don't actually have a mind yourself. So for this reason, I want to consider a different theory of how you could be related to atoms. And you might even be thinking, you know, these first theories, like who holds those? You know, are these sort of like straw men theories? My wife, Rachel, was kind of telling me about this. I was sharing with her this presentation and she was pointing out that she just doesn't think these initial theories could possibly be considered the most plausible theories. And maybe that's right. Uh, my, my response to her is that I have the limitation of being a philosopher. 
And <laughs> this is the limitation because as I've looked at these particular theories and the theories that come later, I actually find that there are problems with the theories that we're gonna talk about later that seem at least as severe as the problems with these initial theories. Minus my favorite theories at the very end. There are two theories at the very end that I think can roll away some of these deep puzzles. I could be wrong, there could be other options, of course, but I sort of maybe am unsure that these initial theories are the least plausible when I think about the problems with these other theories. Maybe it doesn't take a philosopher to have this impression, but I do think it takes a certain amount of careful analysis to arrive at this. And this is something that a number of philosophers have come to arrive at. This is why I said, even looking at that previous theory, going back up to you don't exist, there are different philosophers who have arrived at this. I've met two in person philosophers who for various reasons said to me that they were skeptical of their own existence. And in both cases, it had to do with some of these puzzles of how you could possibly exist in a world that is fundamentally determined and built up out of mindless atoms. Now at this point, you're maybe thinking, okay, look, we don't have to get rid of our existence. There are other theories and absolutely that is correct. There are other theories. So let's have a look at the next theory. Theory number three is that you are some particular atoms. So it's not that you are a single atom. Here we're going to allow that there's a plural or a bunch of atoms and you are those atoms. This will avoid the self-defeat problem because even if the atoms are themselves mindless, maybe a group of atoms or a plural of atoms has consciousness. Here the idea is that your thought is instantiated by a collective. So no individual atom instantiates your thought, but the collective together has your thought that I am this collective. Or maybe your thought is a question. Am I this collective? I'm going to offer for you a particular challenge. My goal is not to go into extreme detail on any of these, but just to point to them the replacement challenge. And this would be the challenge of seeing how you could continue to exist after removing some atoms, let's say clipping your fingernails or replacing any particular atoms. So you might imagine clipping your fingernails and then your fingernails grow back. Here you have some atoms that are replaced. This won't be possible on the theory that you are atoms. Because if you are atoms, then you exist wherever those atoms exist. Now you might think, well, if I'm atoms, I'm not my fingernails. Maybe I'm some atoms in my brain. Okay. But on this theory, it's not that you are a particular arrangement of atoms. We'll look at that later. The arrangement theory. It's that you are the atoms themselves. And if that's what you are, then what, then, then you go wherever the atoms go. So if you clip your fingernails or if you move, Re, uh, lose some atoms in your brain, wherever those atoms go, you go. If, if your atoms get replaced with my atoms over time, then somehow you are replaced with me. But this doesn't really make sense on this view because on this view, you are atoms. So you exist wherever those atoms exist. Now here you might be saying to yourself, maybe some of you are thinking, Okay, this is again a kind of straw man interpretation of the view that you are atoms. It's not that you are just atoms. It's that you are atoms when those atoms are arranged in a certain way, like a brain or a functioning nervous system. And if you're thinking that, hold on to that because I'm going to return to this idea later as we look at another theory. My goal here is just to look at each theory one at a time and focus in on a particular way of thinking about this, this theory so that we can separate our cases. I find that a lot of clarity comes from separating out and distinguishing one theory from another. Then we can analyze the implications of each one. So to draw this out a little bit more, here are a couple other particular challenges. One is what I'll call the lasting atoms challenge. The idea here is that your atoms would last even after your body dies. But do you last after your body dies? I'm thinking of the person who believes in the atoms theory as not believing that you are an immaterial spirit or soul that survives the destruction, that lives after death. Okay, so 
if you aren't an immaterial substance or soul or spirit that lives after death, then you can ask the question, well, do you live after death? Well, you do if your atoms last, if you are atoms, you are those atoms. Or here's a related idea. Your atoms existed before your mom was born, but did you exist before your mom was born? Imagine telling your mom that, mom, I existed even before you were born. Now, again, you might believe some of you watching this might think, well, I think I'm an eternal soul or an eternal spirit. But in that case, it's not that you existed before your mom existed. It's rather that you exist prior to or without a particular atomic arrangement, according to this sort of soul or spirit view. And that's not a view that I'm defending here. The, the view that I'm defending here or examining here is the view that what you are is just atoms. Not an arrangement of atoms, just those atoms. So on this view that you are just atoms, you have this problem that it doesn't seem that we're able to account for how you are related to the particular arrangement of atoms. How are you related to a particular brain, for example? Is your sense of being you tied to some atoms even when those atoms leave your brain? Think about this. Imagine that the atoms in your brain are replaced one by one with other atoms. And then your original atoms are formulated into a new brain. All the while you continue to have your own sense of self, your first person perspective attached to the brain whose atoms are all replaced. If that's how things go, then it looks like there's something about the arrangement of atoms into your brain that's connected to you. You don't go with the original atoms. In that case, you can't be the original atoms. Again, I just wanna make sure this is very clear. If you are those atoms, then you go wherever those atoms go. So if you don't go wherever those atoms go, then you can't be the same thing as those atoms. All right, I hope that makes sense. Again, I'm not trying to say that these are knockdown challenges, but just that these are questions for anybody who has these theories to, to consider, to work out. Theory number four is like the previous one. Maybe instead of being a plural of atoms, what you are is a set of atoms. A set is something in addition to the members. It's the package of the members. So you exist over and above the members, the parts, the particles, the atoms. But sets have their members essentially. What that means is that if any member of the set is removed, then that exact set doesn't exist. It'd be replaced maybe with a different set. So if you are a particular set, then you actually have just the same challenge again. You can't replace atoms. You can't survive a, an atom leaving your brain. That would no longer be you. You'd be replaced with a, a new set. Now, some people might just accept this result. They might say, yeah, well, whatever I am, I am a set of atoms. And so when the atom gets replaced, I am replaced with a new being, a new self. I'm going to come back to this idea about how you might persist through changes of atoms. How could you exist at this moment and persist through changes? But many people would say that they do persist. For example, you can have a thought at one time and then you can change your mind. The only way you could change your mind is if you change from one state to another. And if you change from one state to another, that's not the same as you being replaced by a duplicate. That's you being the being a being, the same being, with different states. And this is an important distinction between the being and the states of the being. So my own view is that you can undergo different states. You can change states as you have different thoughts and different feelings. But that's not the same thing as you being replaced with a duplicate or with a twin. One way that I that kind of helped me think about this is if I imagine my atoms getting replaced with other atoms and then my original atoms or being organized to form a twin or a duplicate. And that twin may have a first person sense of self. They might have certain experiences, but that doesn't make them me. They're not me. They're different. I'm, I'm over here. And so if I'm able to continue to exist from moment to moment, then it looks like what I am is not a particular set of atoms if that set is, is replaced or if it's scattered across the universe.
So that's a, a kind of a challenge for this view. It's the same as the, the previous view. Many of you may be anticipating this theory. You're not atoms. You're not a set of atoms. What you are is a particular arrangement of atoms. I'm going to spend some time kind of thinking about ways of understanding this. Uh, one way we could understand this is that you are a particular specific arrangement. So that if you stand up or you change your arrangement, then you no longer exist. Actually, you're not really changing. You're being annihilated because you are a particular arrangement. And so when a new, a new arrangement arises, you're gone. So that's the challenge. I call this the fragility challenge. How can you continue to exist after standing up? How can you continue to exist after changing the arrangement of an atom? How is that even possible? Well, here to help us to think about this, I want to make sure it's clear that to say that you depend on a certain arrangement or other is not the same as being a certain arrangement. Later, we'll consider the idea that maybe you do actually depend on a certain arrangement of matter, but that's still not the same as being that arrangement. If you are that arrangement, then wherever that arrangement exists, you exist. And if the arrangement changes, you're no longer in existence. So somebody might reply to this and they might say, or we might say in reply, maybe what you are is not a specific arrangement, but you're a general arrangement. Maybe there's a certain kind of function of a brain and you are that general function. This then could allow you to stand up and sit down and change in all sorts of ways. But as long as the general function of the brain remains stable, you remain stable. You continue to exist. So here's a picture of a brain and maybe there are particular particles that are coming in and out of that brain, changing the arrangements. And by arrangement, I hope this is clear. I, I don't necessarily just mean a spatial arrangement. I mean any kind of relations between the parts, including functional relations. So this will allow a kind of broad analysis so that on this view, we can include even general functions. As long as the function is in existence, you are in existence if you are that function. Now here's my reply to, to, to the reply. So re the reply to the reply is that if you are a general arrangement, then there is still no way to distinguish the individual you from duplicates of your atoms arranged in the same way. Because think about this with me. It's not that you are the atoms. We talked about that view. It's that in this view, what you are is the arrangement of those atoms. So what that means is that if you have some atoms and you lose those atoms, and then those original atoms are arranged to form your original arrangement, but you are that arrangement, even that general arrangement, then you are going to exist wherever that arrangement exists. This leads to a, a kind of puzzle, and I, I kind of want to just say a contradiction. The contradiction here is that what you are is an individual, but then according to the arrangement theory, there could be multiple individuals that have the same arrangement, in which case what you are is not an individual. You would be more than one thing. You would be the arrangement here and the arrangement here. But that contradicts the idea that what you actually are is the individual that has a certain arrangement or the original that has a certain state, the individual, the particular individual. So that's my reply to this. I, I don't think the arrangement theory really can account for the sense in which you are an individual being. Yes, you come into certain arrangements. Yes, you can have some kind of connection to particles arranged in a certain way. But it's not that you are that arrangement. Again, because if you are that arrangement, then you only exist when that arrangement exists. And you exist wherever that arrangement exists. And this seems to contradict the idea that you could exist locally even if something else instantiates that same particular arrangement, even that same general arrangement. So let me move then to theory number six. When we talk about seven theories, so we're getting close to completing every possible theory of your relationship to atoms. Theory number six is that you are some kind of whole that's unified 
and we can sort of leave open how it's unified, this hole is composed of atoms. There's a general challenge, and I'm going to look at specific challenges in a moment, but the general challenge, we can call this the unification challenge, which is the question about what unifies the whole so that it counts as literally you. Okay, not a representation of you, now, not a, a facilitation of your form, not a state of you, but it is you. What makes a certain cloud of atoms literally you? So that, that's a challenge, that's a question, that's not an objection to the view. For all of us who may hold this view, this is just an invitation for us to think about how we might answer the challenge. So to help us to think about this, I'm actually going to divide this sixth theory into two types or two versions. One version is going to say that, well, whatever you are, you are grounded in atoms. Your identity is grounded in atoms. So you are made of atoms and what you are is grounded in those atomic parts, those mindless atomic parts. A different view is going to say that your identity is not grounded in atoms, but you still have atoms as parts. So that will be theory 6b. I'm going to focus first on theory 6a and I have a lot to say about this theory because this is the one that I think leads to the greatest puzzles. These are puzzles that make me want to revisit the first theory that you don't exist unless there's other theories that we can look at. Because if we say that you are grounded in your atoms, there's this deep question about how that could be possible. This relates to several different puzzles three replacement puzzles. There's the transporter experiment puzzle, the demarcation problem, which I'll talk about, and I bolded the brain minus puzzle problem, which is the one that I'm going to unpack the most for you here. Briefly, I want to point to these two. So the transporter experiment problem, we can set it up this way. Let's say that what your identity is, is grounded in some atoms. And let's say that you get on to a transporter, like in Star Trek, where the way this works is that your atoms are annihilated. But don't worry, because duplicate atoms are going to be created on the planet where you're getting transported to. And they're going to be arranged in the exact formation as your original atoms. So if all goes according to plan, those new atoms in the original arrangement are going to generate your consciousness. They're going to make you, you. But wait, what happens if there's a malfunction and the original atoms are not destroyed? Instead, they remain on the ship in the same arrangement. Well, this leads to a kind of a puzzle because if your identity is grounded in your atoms, then it looks like what you are is going to be something that's still on the ship. Those atoms are still there. You have duplicate atoms on the planet. But this is a little weird because now we can imagine a scenario where your atoms are actually replaced with your duplicate atoms. So imagine one by one, each of the duplicate atoms on the planet are replaced with your original atoms. What happens to you? Do you go with the duplicate? Well, it seems like if your identity is grounded in your atoms, then your identity should be grounded in your original atoms. Or if we say that your identity is grounded with the new atoms that you get, the question is what distinguishes those, what makes you you? Why do you go to the one place rather than the other? The problem here is that it seems like merely third person external facts about atoms and their positions and their functions aren't going to include the first person information about your own sense of self, where you actually sense yourself to be. So the transporter experiment kind of exposes this, let's say, attention between analyzing you in terms of just atoms and their arrangements, and on the one hand, and your first person awareness of yourself on the other. How does this work? So that's one kind of a puzzle, and there are different things we could try to say in response. One kind of response is to appeal not just to the positions of the atoms, but to appeal to some psychological facts about you. But then this is going to lead to a different view, which is that your identity is not just grounded in your atoms, these mindless atoms, but that somehow your identity is grounded in maybe some kind of mind or consciousness. So that would be a way of solving the problem, but by leading us to a different view. 
A second type of puzzle has to do with demarcation. This is about demarcating you in the overlapping clouds of atoms. I was thinking about this kind of recently because I was with my wife, Rachel, shopping for some clothes. She was looking for some clothes and I got distracted because I saw a mannequin and I was thinking about consciousness. And I was thinking about that, how that mannequin doesn't appear to be conscious in any way. But then I started thinking about this, de this demarcation problem. I thought, if it were conscious, there are many overlapping clouds of atoms that are functionally equivalent or nearly so. So for example, there's all the atoms that make up the mannequin minus an interior atom towards its surface. Well, it's functionally, it's, it's pretty much the same as the rest. It, it's, if, if, if the whole mannequin is conscious, then the mannequin minus a single atom would presumably also be conscious. But why do you count the total mannequin? And what even makes it the total mannequin? How do you demarcate the boundaries? You've got many overlapping clouds of atoms. And you zoom in, you see it's like mostly empty space, lots of different atoms, overlapping clouds. Same with brains. A brain is a cloud of atoms, but there are many different overlapping clouds of atoms. And the difference between a single atom doesn't seem to make the difference between being conscious if you can lose an atom and still be conscious. So this leads to a demarcation problem, or sometimes people talk about the too many thinkers problem. Each cloud of atoms that functions as a functioning thinker is a thinker. And since there are many overlapping clouds of atoms that can function as a thinker, it looks like we have multiple thinkers overlapping each other. Okay, that's a little weird. And you might think this is a kind of a philosopher's puzzle. Philosophers get weirded out by this. But I don't think it's just that. It's not just a, a semantic trick. I think it really is about using conceptual analysis and thinking carefully about the implications of different views to sort of see, well, which view kind of makes the most sense of our data. So I actually want to unpack the replacement puzzle in terms of this brain minus puzzle. This is the puzzle that actually gave me the inspiration for this whole presentation. I was watching my kids play with some Legos and I was thinking about how those Legos could possibly form a conscious being. And it reminded me of this puzzle that I first discovered this in graduate school and it kind of blew my mind. It's one of those things that my wife, she tells me, hey Josh, you know, that puzzle feels like it could be a technical trick. It doesn't necessarily feel like, I don't know, like it's not, it's not really getting to the heart of what's going on. And I really appreciate that. But I also think that the reason why it feels like a technical trick is because it takes a certain, well, I think part of it, I want to say it takes a certain amount of, of uh, analytical surgery to bring into light the relevant con concepts. But I think another reason, another challenge here is that we have ordinary ways of talking about identity. When we talk about the identity of a laptop maintaining itself, you lose a chip, you don't, you're not worried that the laptop doesn't exist or that, you know, it's no longer the same laptop. And I think that's because we have conventions for treating things as the same thing. When I unpack this brain minus puzzle, what you're going to see is that I'm going to be playing on these conventions. And what I'm going to be exposing here is that if we actually think of us as really existing, not just existing according to a convention, but actually really existing, then we're going to have a puzzle according to this theory 6a. So let me unpack the puzzle for you. I'm going to start with um, a question and the question has to do with how a pile of things, you can think of rocks or carbon atoms, could be conscious merely by moving something away from the pile. So you might think it's hard to see how it could be conscious just by assembling things, but let's just grant for sake of argument that there is a way in which things, if they function like a brain, those things are conscious. But there's a deeper question about how, if they're not conscious, they could become conscious just by moving something away from the pile. And you might be wondering why I'm asking this question. Well, this question is going to come back when I unpack this argument. This has to do with thinking about this pile as kind of like a brain minus a particular particle. You move the particle away from that brain minus, the, the brain minus the particle, and then that thing becomes the conscious thing. 
How does that work? So here are some definitions to unpack the argument. First, I'm going to define this principle called atomic grounds. Atomic ground says that your identity is grounded in your atoms. The persistence principle says that you could survive the loss of a single atom. So if there's an atom inside your brain and it leaves, you still exist. Uh, you don't go out of existence. You're not replaced. You can continue to have a thought. Maybe the atom gets replaced. Maybe not. But either way, you don't need that atom. So we're going to just define brain as just something composed of exactly your atoms. We're going to assume that you are composed of atoms and that your identity is grounded in your atoms somehow. Let brain minus be something that is composed of your atoms minus some disposable atom. So we're going to understand brain minus as something that would exist. It's made of your atoms and it would exist if you lose a particular atom by the persistence principle. You could survive the loss of an atom, and if you do, you shrink down to the size of brain minus if you continue to exist. So here's the argument, and this is going to be an argument against this theory 6a, that your identity is grounded in your atoms, and it goes like this. Suppose that you are your brain, a unified whole, and suppose you, you, you lose an atom. Now, we'll revisit whether this is possible, because there's also a puzzle, even if this isn't possible, even if you can't persist, there's still um, a, a puzzle here. But for focus, let's just assume you can lose an atom, you can continue to exist. Then you and brain minus have the same atoms in the same arrangement. Then you are identical to brain minus according to the atomic grounds, because according to the atomic grounds, your, your identity is grounded somehow in your atoms. And after you've lost an atom, the only thing left is atoms arranged in a certain way. And so you still existed. So your identity must be grounded in, in those atoms arranged, uh, arranged in that certain way. So there's only one thing left to be you, which is brain minus, according to atomic grounds. But you aren't identical to brain minus, and I will prove that. First, you lost A as an interior part. Brain minus never lost A as an interior part. A was next to brain minus. This is like that rock pile. You move something away from the rock pile, and the rock pile now becomes conscious. In this case, it's brain mi minus, a pile of, of carbon atoms, an arrangement of carbon atoms. Form a conscious being now. So that, that would be a contradiction, um, that you are identical to brain minus, and you are not identical to brain minus. That is a contradiction. And that follows from these principles together with the starting assumption that you are brain. And brain is just something that's a unified whole made out of atoms. At this point, you might be thinking, okay, wait, wait, I think there's a trick here. Something's gone wrong. Um, the conclusion's pretty dramatic. You're not a brain. How could we just show this just by these steps? This is, this is like the philosopher's trick that my wife is, is worried about. And I appreciate that. I appreciate that worry. So let's just have a closer look. Let's take some stock at what's going on here. The contradiction arises from two principles. There's the persistence principle that you could survive the loss of an atom. So this includes the principle that you exist and you can continue to exist from moment to moment, even as atoms are replaced or changed in and out. Together with atomic grounds that your identity is grounded in your atoms. This is what gives us the idea that you are brain minus if you lose an atom because then you shrink down to brain minus. That's the only thing that you could be. Atoms arranged just like a brain, just a little bit of a smaller brain. But this leads to the contradiction because you can't be brain minus if you and brain minus have different histories. You have a different history. You used to have that disposable atom as one of your interior parts. Brain minus never had that as an interior part, so you can't be brain minus. So this leads to a flat contradiction, and to avoid that contradiction, we've got to get rid of these principles. Fortunately, this is possible. We can get rid of the principles. We don't have to accept these principles. So think again about that rock pile. Whether you persist or not, even if we give up the persistence principle, there's still a puzzle that arises just from atomic, pro that atomic grounds all on its own. Because whether you exist or not, 
Suppose a conscious being exists by organizing atoms into a certain composition, like a functioning nervous system. Suppose that's enough to make a conscious being. Then you get this strange result. A pile of things, whether it's rocks or atoms in the form of a brain, could themselves become conscious, think of brain minus, becoming conscious, just by moving something away from that pile. The idea here is that the thing, the brain minus, is not itself a conscious being. Before you move the thing away from it, so it's the only thing that you could be. In which case, if you're a conscious being, it follows that it is a conscious being. You could avoid this by saying that actually what's going on is that there are many overlapping conscious beings, each with their own first person perspective. But that is also a strange result. That leads us back to the problem of too many thinkers or too many minds. All of these results come from thinking carefully, I think, about our relationship to atoms if we have certain starting assumptions that may be so familiar to us. But there is a way of avoiding these results. I don't think this is a mere philosopher's trick. I think this is actually a way of seeing by logic and reason the implications of certain views that really don't fit well with a fuller analysis in my view. And I want to just draw out one more point on this. The result, this strange result here, I'm calling it a strange result, it contradicts the intrinsicality of composition, by which I mean things compose something by their relations to each other. So if this pile of rocks doesn't actually compose something, it's just a pile. It's many things organized in a pile sort of way. It doesn't actually compose a conscious being. Then if you move something away from the pile, you haven't changed the intrinsic properties of the things or their relations to each other. And since you haven't changed their intrinsic properties or their relations to each other, you've done nothing to explain how it would now suddenly be a whole being. A being that has consciousness, that has intrinsic thoughts and feelings of its own. But this is the result of the view that you can, just going back to the argument, you can lose a part. And by losing a part, all that's left is the brain minus, the pile of, of atoms. And you moved an atom away from that pile. And now that pile of atoms is you, if we assume... Again, it's either you or something else, right? Or some conscious being, if we assume that conscious beings are grounded in the atoms. Because what else, what else could you be now? You have to be grounded in the atoms. So you are brain minus. Okay. So if that was a bit confusing, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share the responsibility for that. Uh, this is a complex set of ideas. And if you want to look at this in more detail, a philosopher named Trent Merricks, he unpacks this in his book, Persons and Objects, where he talks about these particular puzzles. And I think he does a very fine job unpacking each of the, the different problems here that we're talking about. A different way that we can avoid all these problems is to say that you are a whole, but you're not actually grounded in your atoms. So some different philosophers have uh, proposed something like this. Trent Merricks himself proposes something like this as a way of, of getting out of the problems. Uh, one way of thinking about this is through the prior identity hypothesis, which is that your identity is prior to any particular formation of atoms. This could explain how you could have different atoms. It's because your identity is not tied to any particular atoms. This could explain how you could actually stand up and change your arrangement of atoms. Maybe even change your personality over time. You are the thing that has your personality. That thing is still in existence because its identity, its core identity, isn't actually um, dependent on the particular atoms or their arrangements. It's prior to them. Yet, the atoms can still come into parts to be parts of you. On this view, your parts don't make you who you are. It's almost like it's the other way. Um, you are who you are, and in virtue of who you are, you organize your parts into certain formations. 
Now, each of these theories has a challenge. So a challenge for this one is the mind-body challenge. How do you relate to your atoms? What is your relationship to your atoms if your atoms don't determine your identity? If your identity is prior to your atoms, then how is it that you inform, how do you interact with your atoms? There are different ways we could think about this. There are different uh, theories. Uh, there's a hylomorphic theory on which you are a composite of a form and some stuff or something. It could be matter, it could be psychological stuff. We could kind of leave open how this works. Uh, and this would be, there's a version of the hylomorphic view that would fit into this particular theory that could give an answer to this question. Um, my own view is that this question sort of comes back in new forms, even for the hylomorphic view, even for other views. And so this is a challenge that anybody, anybody who holds this view is gonna wanna think about this particular challenge. Again, I hope you can appreciate my goal is not to knock down all the different theories with the challenges, but to sort of invite those who would hold the different theories to think about those challenges. And those who do hold these theories would usually have some kind of a solution to, to, to the challenges. A final theory is just that you're not composed of atoms. This is a theory that I've come to. This has been kind of a, an update over the last few years, actually. Previous to this, I thought, well, maybe I am related to atoms as parts of me. I'm a whole that can exist prior to my parts. But I've, I've kind of relinquished that view and I've come to think that um, on my view that something else is going on here. Um, the atoms could come into arrangements that represent me, like a picture that could represent me or an image of me, uh, an experience of myself. Even in, in a dream, I'll have a kind of avatar of my body that represents me. But that doesn't mean that those atoms uh, literally compose me. Right? Like the atoms of this picture don't literally compose the being. And on my view, the atoms even of this body don't compose me, the being. They compose a particular body that represents me. You could be causally integrated with atoms. So I think I'm causally connected to my atoms. There's a causal integration. Even if causal integration is not by itself sufficient for parthood. This is a key idea because some would say that the causal integration is what makes the atoms parts of you. That was kind of a view that I had for a while as a working hypothesis, but my recent update is to kind of just relinquish that and just to say, no, the atoms form bodies that represent me, like a picture, but they aren't literally parts of me. They're parts of the representation. This leads me to a first person self hypothesis. This is a hypothesis about what I am that allows me to roll away all of those puzzles that we talked about. Because every one of those puzzles about how you're related to your parts are based on these, these um, ideas. Well, I, let me just say all the different theories, except for theory 6B, which allows that you're not um, grounded or your identity is not grounded in your parts. But as long as you have a kind of grounding relationship to the mindless bits, then the mindless bits in a way are sort of the identity puppet master. They make you who you are. The mindless makes you who you are. And the view that I have, it kind of flips that actually, that you are a first person self. And by this, I mean two things. First, a first person self is something that has a first person perspective, a point of view, what it's like to be you having thoughts and feelings. You can experience uh, the world from, from your perspective. And that this first person perspective of your own self and self-awareness is not reducible to purely third-person perspectiveless items like mindless atoms. So it's kind of an irreducib irreducible self-view. So your self is real instead of analyzing yourself in terms of other things that aren't mental, that aren't, uh, that have no thoughts or consciousness. I take that the self is itself a, an irreducible unit of reality. It is as it appears, if I could use that language, from the first person perspective in self-awareness. So it's not that this first person self-view doesn't uh, lead to its own set of questions, but it doesn't enter into any of those, those puzzles of parts because the mindless things aren't, the mindless atoms aren't parts of you. There are other puzzles, other questions to talk about, important questions, but to solve the puzzles of parts, I, I would kind of recommend this, this particular view. But whatever your view, I have a set of conclusions that kind of wrap up for me kind of a big picture of what I, I think is at stake here. So first, 
that you are a familiar being, but you're a significant piece of reality. You're familiar. You're, you recognize yourself when you wake up. It's like, there I am. I exist. You look at yourself in the mirror. There I am, or a representation of me, right? You see the images uh, reflecting back. But you're a significant piece of reality. If you're really there, if you really exist, you're very significant. Thinking about how you could relate into the world is not a trivial matter. The puzzles of parts, I think, expose your significance by exposing the many challenges of fitting you into the world with atoms. My solution, as I said, to the puzzles is that the me that I experience in first-person introspection is real. I'm really real. Okay? I, I, I don't just exist according to a convention. In fact, I think conventions themselves depend on persons. Persons don't depend on conventions. It's the other way. Conventions depend on the prior existence of persons. So my existence is not dependent on somebody treating me according to a convention as being the same being just because I have enough of the same parts. I'm actually real, independent of whether I'm even recognized as real by others. I'm a real being. And I'm fundamental, by which I mean I'm not reducible to third-person mindless atoms. I am a being, I have a mind, I have thoughts, and my existence doesn't reduce to mindless things. Finally, whatever your view, because you might not agree with me, and that's okay. I just want to say, may the light of reason continue to serve you in the illumination of the great treasure of who you are. Thank you so much.